Hey everyone, we're on our uh, last topic block now. So we're in the home stretch. Also by the calendar you can tell by default. Um, but we're gonna move on to constitutive equations. So coming up with models for materials response. So like how the internal energy or entropy responds to temperature, how stress responds to strain, things like that. <clears throat> And we're going to do that in a way that is consistent with frame indifference and with the second law of thermodynamics. So if you think of, say, a purely mechanical theory, we have balance of mass and balance of momentum to worry about. And our variables would be the stress, the density, and, say, the velocity or the displacement that we need to solve for. So if you think of the velocity as having um, you know, three scalar components, then let's say it's incompressible, so we don't have to maybe solve for the density. And then you would still need a fourth equation. Well, you'd, you'd have four scalar variables plus the stress, which uh, we know it's symmetric if we're doing the Cauchy stress, so that would be you know, six scalar variables there. So we need something to relate, say, velocity and something else to, uh, to the, the stress so that we end up only having four unknowns since we only have four equations. So we need constitutive relations to relate the quantities of interest like stress and velocity or its gradient, things like that, in order to get a closed set of equations. So in fluid mechanics, we might pick the density, velocity, and absolute temperature as the state variables with the governing equations, balance of mass, momentum, and energy. So in that sense, what we would need to, uh, to define Rho V and theta as the state. And so, so we'll need to define a constitutive response function that's going to give us the intern the specific internal energy. And we'll denote constitutive response functions with a hat. Um, and in that case, it's going to end up <clears throat> being a function of the temperature like that. We'll show in the rigid heat conductor thing. So we're going to develop a constitutive response function for rigid heat conductors and find all the thermodynamic restrictions on it today. And the next time we'll do it for fluids. Um, but, you know, we'll find that the internal energy is going to be a function of temperature. Likewise, the specific entropy is going to be eta hat of the temperature. Maybe the Cauchy stress is a tensorial valued constitutive response function, that's a function of the density, the velocity gradient, and the temperature, <clears throat> and maybe the heat flux Q is equal to a vector-valued constitutive response function. Um, that one's going to have grad theta. So like I said, we'll put the hat over things to say that it's a constitutive response function for that variable. So we'll denote them. 
so phi is going to be a scalar vector or tensor field that we're trying to model the constitutive response of it. So at any point, it is equal to phi hat of lambda of x and t and x. So in other words, for a given material point, the constitutive response function is always the same. So the material is always the same since the constitutive response function really defines the material. And then all other things come in through this lambda, which is one or more fields based on the chosen state variables and their derivatives. So it can be their time derivatives or their gradients. So like we have, you know, the velocity is the time derivative of the displacement. Maybe something depends on the velocity um, or maybe it depends on the displacement. And if you think of heat conduction, you know, that depends on the gradient of the temperature. All right, so to be consistent with thermodynamics and the frame indifference of physical balance laws, we're going to require that the constitutive response functions be frame indifferent since the balance laws are frame indifferent. So if you make your constitutive response function not frame indifferent, you will end up with a balance law that isn't. I suppose it would be a reduced balance law, like if you plug in your <coughs> representation for, say, the Cauchy stress in terms of its constitutive response function. If you have a constitutive model that isn't frame indifferent, then your balance law, your reduced balance law, would no longer be frame indifferent. So if phi is equal to phi hat, the constitutive response function of lambda in the frame F, then phi star, which would be the quantity in the frame F star has to equal the same constitutive response function, but now evaluated on lambda star. So in other words, it has to be the same constitutive response function. <clears throat> the next thing that we'll require is that the constitutive response functions that we select be incapable of violating the second law of thermodynamics for any admissible combination of the constitutive response functions variables. All right, so now we're going to go through this process of developing and restricting a constitutive model. And we're going to do it for kind of the simplest case, or at least a very simple case. I suppose you could argue over which is the simplest case, but we're going to look at rigid heat conductors. <clears throat> 
so a rigid heat conductor is one that the material itself doesn't deform any. It undergoes rigid motion. So it doesn't mean that there isn't stress within it or anything like that. It just means that we don't need to solve for the balance of mass or the balance of momentum in order to know what's going on with the balance of energy, since the density will be constant if you follow a material point. Um, and if we look at the thermal energy equation, you know that the velocity gradient of a rigid motion is skew symmetric, so d is equal to zero. So T inner product D is equal to zero, so there is no internal power to worry about. So energy balance is purely thermal. So you have like rho epsilon dot is equal to minus div Q plus Q sort of deal. <clears throat> so we'll write out the thermodynamic laws. first, and we'll do them in integral form first, the integral over a spatial region convecting with the body of epsilon dv. We can get rid of the rho because it's constant, um, but then you recognize that it's, you know, it's per unit mass still at the end. Uh, that is equal to minus the integral over the boundary of q dot n dA plus the integral <clears throat> over the volume of q dV. Um, the book did some weird notational stuff here. I don't know why they did it. Um, they acknowledge that they're talking about a spatial region convecting with the body, because of course they are with a balance law that goes like this. But they used um, a non-script P on the integral there, which would sort of imply a you know reference configuration volume. But in the text, they say spatial. so. We're talking about a spatial region that's convecting with the body. All right, so then the second law, if we can get the pen there, is that the time derivative of the entropy contained in that region is greater than or equal to minus So this is going to be the clausius duhem sort of thing. So the entropy flux is Q, the heat flux, divided by the absolute temperature, dot N dA plus the entropy source due to thermal effects. Q was specifically due to heating. There we go. And then the local forms of those are simple. So we have that the material time derivative of epsilon is equal to minus the divergence of the heat flux plus the heat source. And the material time derivative of the entropy is greater than or equal to minus div <coughs> Q over the temperature plus scale or Q over the temperature. So we can play around with adding and subtracting things and we end up with epsilon dot minus theta times eta dot. So basically we're multiplying this by theta and 
subtracting it from this is now less than or equal to, since we subtracted it, and we have minus div q plus theta div q over theta All right, and then we can combine those last two terms. Epsilon dot minus theta, eta dot is less than or equal to negative one over the absolute temperature times the heat flux dot the temperature gradient. All right, so you remember the free energy, psi, it's going to go like this. The free energy is equal to the internal energy minus the temperature times the entropy. All oh, specific. Um, one temperature isn't specific, but the internal energy, entropy, and free energy are specific. So free energy imbalance is this. <clears throat> so that's just, this is going to come from just plugging in that relation into the equation above. We have that psi dot minus the entropy times the material time derivative temperature plus 1 over theta q dot grad theta is equal to minus theta times gamma, so that's the dissipation, minus the dissipation, which is less than or equal to 0. You recall gamma is the entropy production, the dissipation is <coughs> theta times it. All right, well, we have one scalar balance law, namely the balance of energy, which is really the only thing that we have to solve. So we need to get down to one scalar state variable. Um, in heat conduction stuff, the choice will almost always be the absolute temperature. So we'll want to be able to express the free energy, the internal energy, the entropy, and the heat flux in terms of the temperature and its gradients and its time derivatives. So we're going to want constitutive response functions that look like this. Psi is equal to psi hat of, let's examine theta and grad theta. Eta is equal to eta hat theta grad theta. Same thing with epsilon. And Q, Ugh, that's a terrible Q. This is equal to Q hat. <coughs> so you notice that we have them all depending on everything, even though you probably already know that these ones here are not going to depend on the temperature gradient. Um, 
there's this thing called the principle of equipresence that Clifford Truesdell was pretty insistent on, and it makes sense. Basically, what he's saying is that you have to at least examine the possibility that all of your items of interest, your fields of interest, depend on all of the constitutive response variables. Uh, the, the reason being that on a microscopic scale or on an atomic scale, the same physical phenomenon are leading to all of the interactions. And so, you know, we can only rule out something depending on, so we can only rule out, say, psi depending on grad theta um, if we can show that dependence on it would violate a physical law like the second law of thermodynamics or if it would violate frame indifference. Um, and then you can rule it out. Otherwise, if it isn't, you know, if you want to model a material as not being dependent on it, then that isn't a, uh, you know, it's that the dependence of it is small for that material, but there would still be, you know, you'd have to measure and model that response. So like there are some materials, for instance, that are pretty insulative, so maybe you don't model conduction with them. But it's not because there's no conduction. It's uh, because it's really resistive. All right, so one thing that we do have as a starter. So basically, we're going to figure out restrictions on how these variables can depend on those constitutive response variables. Well, we know that epsilon, which is equal to epsilon hat, the constitutive response function of theta and grad theta, has to be equal to psi hat of theta and grad theta plus theta times eta hat of theta and grad theta. All right, so now we're going to get into what's called the Coleman Knoll procedure. So we're going to plug in these functional forms into the second law of thermodynamics and figure out what can depend on what else and what can't depend on that. So in other words, we're going to show that this one isn't able to that these three are not able to depend on the temperature gradient in this context. Um, so let's do that. <coughs> let's denote G, the vector field, as the spatial gradient of the temperature. Um, and we're going to do that to make things shorter, because there's going to be a lot of temperature gradients flying around here. All right, so then psi is equal to psi hat of theta and G. And so if we want to take the time derivative, of psi, we'll say the material time derivative, then we can use the chain rule and partial derivatives. I guess partial derivatives, really. Psi dot is equal to the partial derivative of psi hat of theta and g with respect to theta times theta dot plus partial psi hat theta and g partial g. So that's going to be a vector. And then dotted with the time derivative of g. All right, well, we remember free energy imbalance. 
and this is specifically for a rigid heat conductor now. Since we took out any of the <coughs> mechanical portion of it, um, we have that psi dot plus eta theta dot plus 1 over theta q dot g is equal to minus theta gamma, which is less than or equal to 0. So we can plug in that expression for psi dot. And what we get is theta dot. So that's the material time derivative of the temperature times partial psi hat of theta and g d theta plus eta hat theta and g plus partial psi hat of theta and g partial g dot g dot plus 1 over theta times q hat theta and g dot g is less than or equal to 0. So we look, this term here is these two terms. All right, so at any point x naught and time t naught, we could find a valid temperature field and time history that has any given values of theta, g, theta dot, and g dot. So not that one particular field does, but if we, you know, we could find an admissible one that has any values of those, um, you know, provided theta is positive since it's absolute temperature. So in other words, we have to consider the idea that theta g, theta dot, and g dot are independent and arbitrarily assignable. well with theta greater than 0. So that's our only restriction on consideration there. All right, well, in light of the fact that those are arbitrarily assignable, then you know the term multiplying theta dot has to be 0 on its own. And the time multiply, or the term multiplying g dot has to be zero on its own, since this doesn't depend on theta dot. You know, if this depended on theta dot, then there'd be room to do something here. But since it doesn't depend on theta dot, then theta dot times it has to be zero all the time, then this had better be zero. And likewise, this doesn't depend on g dot, so it has to be zero, since g dot is arbitrary. On the other hand, q does depend on g, so it dot g, we can still find a way to make that always less than or equal to 0 because q depends on g. So <clears throat> you know, when, when you inner product it with it, it can depend on it. All right, so what we get then is that partial get the pen partial psi hat of so this is the first term that we're looking at here so this has to be 0 of theta and g partial theta 
plus eta hat of theta and g has to equal 0 for any combination of theta and grad theta, provided theta is greater than 0. And from the second term, we have that the derivative of the free energy, the partial derivative of the free energy with respect to the temperature gradient has to be 0, since the time derivative of the temperature gradient is arbitrary and independent of the temperature gradient. So partial psi hat of theta and g partial g is equal to vector 0. So psi hat can't depend on the temperature gradient. So we have that psi is now psi hat of just the temperature. And as a result, if we look at this, well, if psi hat doesn't depend on g, but this sum has to be 0, yeah, we can look at it right here, then you know, if this doesn't depend on g, then this can't depend on g, or it won't always equal 0. So we know that then eta hat also can't depend on g is equal to eta hat of the temperature. And so we look here, and what we have is that the constitutive response function for the entropy has to equal minus the derivative of the constitutive response function for the free energy with respect to the temperature. And it's just a function of the temperature. And um, you know, as a result, we're also going to end up with the internal energy is equal to <coughs> eta hat of theta. All right, we also end up with a restriction on this, namely that that has to be less than or equal to 0 all the time. So the we'll number this one i double i so these two are called state restrictions and then we get a third one which is a thermodynamic restriction And that is going to be that q hat of theta g dot g is less than or equal to 0 for all g. And this is called the reduced dissipation inequality. reduced in the sense that we plugged in our functional form for the constitutive models and ruled out all of the other terms in the dissipation inequality, which is a synonym for free energy imbalance. All right, so from the definition of the free energy, the internal energy is going to look like this. So epsilon is equal to epsilon hat of theta is equal to 
psi hat of theta plus theta times eta hat of theta. And we already related eta to the derivative of psi with respect to, so the derivative of the free energy with respect to the temperature. So we have that that is equal to the free energy minus the temperature times the derivative of the free energy. Ugh. Whatever happened there. with respect to the temperature. All right, well, we can take the material time derivative of everything here, and we get that epsilon dot is equal to psi dot plus theta theta dot plus theta theta dot. Why did that do that? Oh, well. And we also have that psi dot plus eta theta dot is equal to, so that's from right up here, that is equal to d psi hat theta d theta plus hat theta theta dot. And we showed that that has to be equal to 0, uh, specifically because this is equal to 0. And so as a result, if we look at this above thing here, then what we're going to end up with is that psi dot is equal to minus eta theta dot, and therefore epsilon dot is equal to theta eta dot. So these two here are known as the Gibbs relations, and they apply pretty much in any thermal theory. Often they're taken as a starting point, um, but we can also show them here for rigid heat conductors from the dissipation inequality and the functional form that we've picked for things. Um, so as a result of these two Gibbs relations, we can get an equality for entropy. So we can directly show what the time derivative of entropy is. So we'll call this entropy balance. <laughs> the temperature times eta dot, so that's epsilon dot, is equal to minus div q plus Q, entropy balance. Oops. Terrible quotes. All right, so the temperature dependent constitutive modulus defined by the derivative of the internal energy with respect to the temperature is called the specific heat. So it's C theta defined as the derivative of epsilon hat theta d theta. It's called the specific heat. <laughs> 
C is theta is equal to the temperature times the derivative of the entropy with respect to the temperature is equal to minus the second derivative of the free energy with respect to the temperature by the Gibbs relations. The entropy production is there for this. Gamma is equal to minus 1 over theta, q dot grad theta. And so that's got to be greater than or equal to 0 for any grad theta. All right, now let's define a scalar field phi, which is a function of the temperature theta and the temperature gradient g. As the inner product of q hat theta and g dot g. So the second law requires that this phi be less than or equal to 0 for any theta and g, at least provided theta is positive. zero for all theta and g. And clearly we have that phi, bleh, phi of theta and vector zero is equal to zero for all Theta, since the inner product of anything with the zero vector is always going to be zero. And um, if we take the partial derivative of this with respect to g, so the partial derivative of phi with respect to g, then we get partial phi of theta and g partial g. It's going to be the transpose of the derivative of this. No, it's going to be, yeah, this, and then plus the transpose of its derivative with respect to g times g. So we get is equal to q hat of theta and g plus partial q hat of theta and g, partial g. So this is a tensor, and that's why we can take the transpose of it, and it's acting on g. And so um, because phi of theta and g has a local or has a maximum value of 0 at g equals 0, we have um, that its derivative with respect to g there has to be vector 0. have that the partial derivative of phi, theta, and g with respect to g evaluated at 
g equals 0, that has to equal vector 0. So partial phi, theta, and g, partial g, evaluated at g is equal to 0, is equal to q hat theta and 0 plus partial q hat theta and g partial g transpose acting on 0. This is at um, g is equal to 0. Well, this term is 0 since it's multiplying the 0 vector. And this, we just said, has to be 0. So that can only happen if q of theta and vector 0 is equal to 0 for all theta. So the heat flux must vanish whenever the temperature gradient does. All right, now let's talk about Fourier's law, which um, is linear thermal conductivity and is pretty broadly applicable, even though it should only work for moderate values of heat flux. Um, but we find it works pretty darn well an awful lot of the time, even with what we would consider pretty large heat fluxes. But maybe nature sees otherwise. Maybe it thinks they're still small. So since q of theta and 0, q hat, is equal to 0 for all theta, then partial derivative of q hat with respect to theta evaluated at g is equal to 0, um, is equal to 0 for all theta. All right, we're going to use some index notation here because it's going to end up being a little bit easier. Something nasty will pop up, but then we're going to ignore it because it's quadratic and stuff. So. We have that the partial derivative of phi with respect to gi is equal to q hat i plus partial q hat j partial gi gj. So if we take the second derivative of that with respect to g, we're going to get a tensor. partial squared of phi, partial gi, partial gk is equal to partial q hat i, partial gk, plus partial q hat j, partial gi delta j, k, which is to say that partial g, j, partial g, k is delta j, k, plus the second partial derivative of q hat j with respect to g, i, 
gk times gj. All right, so if we suppose that the material is having a temperature distribution that doesn't vary too widely from some theta naught, Not so that d q hat d g theta g evaluated at g is equal to zero doesn't vary a whole lot throughout the body, um, or at least throughout the part of the body that is made of that material. All right, and then let's define the tensor K, conductivity tensor, I suppose we'll call it, is equal to minus the partial derivative of Q hat theta and G with respect to G evaluated at G is equal to 0 and theta is equal to theta naught. So the second derivative of phi with respect to g evaluated at g is equal to 0 is just equal to minus k plus k transpose. So what we did is we went up to this here, and we're looking, right, this second derivative, but we're evaluating it where g is equal to 0. So this, like, nasty term, uh, we get to ignore it, which is good because there's all weird transposes and bleh. So we don't have to worry about it. Um, so the second law is going to require that k be positive definite. That's the reduced dissipation inequality. So we have um, that k g dot g is greater than or equal to 0 for all g. But um, it doesn't necessarily require that it's symmetric. All right, so we have that q hat of theta. And g is equal to minus k g plus things that vanish faster than the temperature gradient for small enough heat flux. So, or rather, so for small enough heat flux. The linear constitutive equation Q hat of theta and G is equal to minus K of G does a pretty good job. So in this situation, the heat flux 
depends only on the temperature gradient and not the temperature. Um, you could imagine situations where K does depend on the temperature, but we're saying that if there's not a whole lot of heat flux or a whole lot of temperature difference, that this does a pretty good job. And that's Fourier's law there. Um, so K only has to be positive definite, not necessarily symmetric, but you know, in the overwhelming majority of theories out there, like when you actually develop a model for a material, it's going to end up being symmetric. Often it'll be isotropic, so it'll be just a scalar multiple of the identity tensor, um, but not necessarily in something like a carbon fiber laminate where you have higher conductivity in one direction than the other. All right, that's it for this. The next one, we'll get on to some fluid models. Um, probably do two or three lectures of that, and we'll be good. I'll get that last homework posted for you folks, uh, hopefully later today. And I see nine of you submitted homework assignment five. Probably have that graded pretty early in the week. That one shouldn't be too bad to grade since it's pretty straightforward. All right, have a good one.